My name is John O'Keefe. I'm the Chief Technical Officer at Instantiations, and I'm here to speak a little bit about our uh, product. Okay? So I'm going to give you an update on what we're doing with our product, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about what I've called the dark underside of 64-bit support. So we're going to tunnel through the caves and just see what was involved uh, in enabling our image for 64-bit support. Because when people think about 64-bit support, many people think, well, they update the VM and then they're done. Not so. Okay, so here we go. Um, I'm going to talk about our release for this year. I'm going to talk about the 64-bit support, as I said, and our next release content. Um, and then you can ask some questions. So first, 2017 release. Version 9 is available now. Um, <laughs> for Windows only. Boo! <laughs> no, but wait. There's more. And you'll see it when I talk about our next release. Oh, yes. Yay. OK. So version 9 is available for Windows only. Um, it's got new 32 and 64-bit VMs. So all our VMs have been replaced with new versions, built with new technology, but fully backward compatible. So you can take a, uh, an image from any of our releases all the way back to version 3 from the early 90s and run it on this VM. Um, the images adapt to the environment they're running in if they're 32-bit images. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, we have dual but shared in, um, environments. Environments is sort of our startup uh, application that lets you choose which development image you want to run. And so we've got one that runs 64-bit, one that runs 32-bit, but both of them support both 32 and 64-bit images. And finally, dual installers. So if you want both 32 and 64-bit, you need to install the product twice. Um, besides that, we've made some other minor changes for version 9 that are available also only on Windows. Um, Greece and Seaside have been updated so that they're current with the uh, most current uh, Faro uh, code as of uh, September. Um, we've added elliptic uh, curve support to our cryptography. Um, the SUnit browser has had some performance improvements. Uh, previously, if you, uh, if you ran SUnit on very large test sets, uh, it slowed down considerably because of the screen updating. And uh, this just allows for turning off the screen updating until you're done. Uh, for Scintilla, we've added uh, two or three languages to our workspace um, syntax assist. And finally, for HTTP multi-part forms, we've made some significant performance improvements there in terms of memory usage and speed. Um, okay, so here we are. Uh, we have new 64-bit VM. Uh, we start our image up, nothing works. Uh, well, that's because we haven't adapted the image for 64-bit. It's the same old 32-bit image, uh, not so good yet. Um, so what did we have to do to the image to make it run in 64-bit? Um, we did work in bootstrapping the image. We did work in uh, serialization. Um, we did work to expose the magic. We uh, did work in 
updating the system so that you must say what you mean when you're making external calls. And I'm going to go through these in a little more detail. Um, we did work in managing elastic OS structures. OS structures are the way we describe data for foreign function interface calls. Uh, and we help you out if you don't have your source code. Not having your source code is a bad thing. But um, it may be a packaged runtime image, in which case there just isn't any source code associated with that at runtime. Or over the years, you may have lost your source code. Or someone, perhaps a vendor of third party parts, has exercised the ability to hide the source code. So we'll talk about what you do then. So first. Uh, bootstrapping. Uh, I'm a current, i.e. pre-version 9 developer of Smalltalk. I have a development image. It's 32-bit because it couldn't be anything else. Uh, what do you do? Well, you have two options. The first option is to use the bootstrapping capability that will transform that 32-bit image into a 64-bit image on the fly when you load it. Uh, that's kind of cool. Um, so that only works for 32-bit images because it's the only place you need it. Um, and for a 64-bit image, well, it just loads normally like uh, you would expect a small talk image to load. And you know, part of, the, part of the adaptation of a 32-bit image to 64-bit is done um, by the VM as it's loading the image. Other parts are done during pre-startup and startup each time you run the image. Um, we don't recommend saving the image. Um, this is from the developer of this automated functionality. He says, I'm pretty sure it works, but if this image is important to you, we don't recommend you save it. And so what we offer for that situation is an offline 32 to 64 bit conversion program that will give you a 64 bit image from your 32 bit image that you can load and use and save and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, the next problem is we use a lot of serialized data with VA Smalltalk. We store things in the NV Manager like user definitions. We store messages in files that are serialized. Uh, and users can serialize data and save it. Um, if you have both 32 and 64-bit images, that want to connect to the same NV repository or use the, the message files, um, that could be a problem because if they are serialized as 64-bit, um, you're not going to be able to read them in a 32-bit image. So what we've done is, by default, all serialization is 32-bit. Now. Uh, you can get in situations where you need to serialize things as 64-bit. And to do that, you just change the default, do your serialization, change it back. And you can do this programmatically. Uh, however, you won't be able to read that serialized data in a 32-bit image because it doesn't know about things like 64-bit addresses. Leandro. In which situation? So, you would need to serialize a 60 a something as 64-bit if it, for example, was very large. It it expanded. It you know. It, yes, really, a very large object. So normally, we expect 32-bit serialization to be sufficient. Um, oh, the magic numbers. So, uh, at least in our images, 
we have lo lots of magic numbers and we keep discovering more and more as we went through this process. Um, and that's a problem because some of these magic numbers relate to sizes of things that involve pointer sizes. Um, so four was a very common magic number. Could be the size of a pointer. Um, or it could be something totally unrelated to pointers. If it's the size of a pointer, it needs to somehow be um, uh, changed, made dynamic, for example, so that on a 32-bit image it's 4, on 64-bit image it's 8. Uh, if it's, in fact, the size of something uh, in your application that has nothing to do with pointers, it has to be left alone. 12 is the size of an object header, 20 is the size of an association. So we had to survey the entire image, find all of these magic numbers, uh, which isn't the easiest thing in the world, um, determine which ones were important to 32 versus 64 bit, and parameterize them. So now we have things like object header size as a, as a method, or VM pointer size as a method that adapts within the method to whether you're running 32 or 64 bit. That probably, in terms of image uh, processing in order to get to 64 bits, was one of the most time consuming uh, efforts um, that we went through. Um, so the next one is say what you mean. In, in VA Smalltalk pre-version 9, uh, foreign function interfaces were rather forgiving about the size that you declared uh, arguments to be. Uh, in fact, everything from unit 8 to unit 32 all expanded to 32 bits when it went through the, uh, the interface. Um, and the new foreign function interface code that we, did, that we developed for 64-bit doesn't do that. You have to declare the size of the parameters explicitly. So there was another survey going through the entire product looking for places where we'd been a little loose in declaring the size of uh, parameters. Um, this one was, this one, the uh, elastic OS structures was really kind of interesting because this solved several problems for us. Um, it solved the problem of running on different platforms where um, the underlying C structs describing data um, either had different fields in them or had fields of different sizes or had fields that were rearranged within the structure for some odd unknown reason. Um, you know, we even found some places on Windows where the fields moved within the structure between a 32-bit struct and a 64-bit struct. Very strange. So our solution was to make the definition of the offsets and the sizes of the fields in an OS struct dynamic rather than static. And then process these definitions at image startup time, which we originally thought might be a performance issue, but turns out to be very fast. Uh, process these definitions to produce the correct definition for the platform or the 3264-bit um, system that you're running on. So this is also completely backward compatible in that if you don't use this capability, if you use the old static definition, you get the old static OS structs. If you use the new dynamic capability, you get these super enhanced OS structs that are, that are elastic. Um, so here was the last of our problems. We don't have source code. 
And, uh, you know, we ran into this in, in uh, um, some of our code because um, when you go to 64-bit, it's a different set of byte codes. Mm, same byte code architecture, but of course the offsets may be different, uh, for example, because if there's things in there that represent uh, pointers, they're going to take more space. So um, you need to recompile methods when you move to 64-bit. If you don't have source code, it's very difficult to recompile the methods. It is possible, although highly unrecommended, to recover source from bytecodes. And it doesn't always work very well, even when you do get out something that resembles source code. So, I've talked about the dynamic 32 to 64 bit uh, image conversion. This is, this is kind of cool for runtime. If you just have a runtime um, application image, you don't have your source anymore. But it has limitations because one of the reasons you may be going to 64 bit is to be able to use 64 bit DLL interfaces. Many external programs that deliver their, uh, their functionality in terms of uh, DLLs um, are moving toward delivering that only in 64-bit versions on Windows, for sure. So even though the 32-bit interfaces of the system itself of Windows will be around probably beyond my lifetime, um, which some days seems kind of short, um, other, other uh, external programs you interface to may not have 32-bit DLLs forever. Um, and so that is one place where the dynamic conversion can't really help you because we don't know enough to uh, modify them for 60, the foreign function interfaces for 64 bits. And none of this um, OS structure elastic support is in your 32-bit image, so the structures can't be uh, adapted. So best is to try and obtain the source code um, from a vault somewhere, from your third-party vendor, or wherever. But we do have, we do have the capability. So those are some of the things that we worked on in adapting the image to be able to run in 64 bits. And we'd kind of thought of most of them or all of them before we started, but they turned out in many cases to be a lot more difficult than we originally imagined. So, oops, wrong button. So now I want to talk about our next release. Oh, nope, not quite. Um, what made, what made uh, our release of 64-bit easier? What made it easier was we started an early adopters program. This was an invitation-only access to our 64-bit code. And, uh, we started this mm, not quite a year ago. And we had uh, a small number of uh, customers who had high impact from 64-bit um, work with this code. And they were, they were willing to suffer through um, some of the bugs that they found. But they were things that we would have never found. The second thing is we had a beta release and that beta release, there were three of them, was, were public and we got a lot of good feedback from our customers there. So that's what made us more confident that when we shipped the code to the field, we were shipping high quality code. Okay, now looking to the future. Our next release 
is going to be real soon now. Um, we're going to have uh, a uh, Linux 3264-bit beta starting very shortly. Um, this will, uh, I don't know how many beta releases there will be. It uh, kind of depends on what's found. Um, so the 64-bit 60, the Linux VM is one major component. The second major component is the beginning of our Unicode support. Um, I've stood up here at conferences here and at ESUG for, well, more years than I care to remember, uh, talking about Unicode and how we were just about ready to start on it. And then I come back the next year and say the same thing. Well, this year we have a plan and we plan on uh, ex uh, you know, exposing that plan because very early in 2018, uh, we'll actually deliver some Unicode support in our next release, 9.1. It'll be the primitives in the VM that are required for Unicode and will be some of the classes, the base classes, to represent Unicode data. So, this is all very exciting to us, and I hope it, it's kind of interesting or exciting to you that finally we have 64-bit, and we're approaching rapidly Unicode support. So, um, my standard chart here that says, how do you get VA Smalltalk? We want you to have it. You can have it for free as an evaluation copy. Um, you just have to register on our website. Um, you can buy development licenses. We love that. That's what, that's what keeps me employed, keeps Seth employed, keeps Alexander employed, and all the other people that work for us. Uh, so if people don't buy licenses, um, we won't have you know, 9.2 and 9.3 releases. But fortunately, people are buying licenses, and we're very happy about that. Um, you can download development betas. I just talked about the 9.1 betas. This will be a public beta. And that's a, that's a full development system um, just with beta support. You can be a committer on an open source project. We'd love it to be one of ours. But it doesn't have to be. It can be some, you know, it can be uh, some other small talk open source project. Um, and there's a website where you can register to get a free paid up license for yourself in that case. Or you can work for an, inst for an educational institution. Uh, or you can be a student. We're a little loose there. So there's lots of ways for you to get um, VA Smalltalk. And we want you to have it in your hands, play with it, let us know what you think of it, and uh, make extensive use of it. So here's some, uh, here's some uh, contact information, general information, web, uh, email address, sales address if you're interested in buying licenses, support request if you have a license and you need support. Thank you. Um, <laughs> do I have questions? Leandro. Uh, well, uh, I, I remember that language being a part of it. Uh, I remember they had a uh, compiler. Uh, so, why you know, it's not that important? I mean, most of your customers have the source code, uh, so this is not a problem. So, Leandro's question is, why am I making a big deal about not having source? Because there are decompilers available. Uh, the problem is, when we compile to bytecodes, we make certain um, optimizations. 
so that when you decompile, you don't get back the same source you started with. I mean, it obviously doesn't have the right instance variable names and class names and all that, but it also isn't functionally the same source as you started with. It can be close. In many cases, it will be close. I've got, uh, I've got at least three different decompilers that I've tried that I've gotten from various people, and none of them will reproduce those byte codes in a round trip. Other questions? Uh, yes. Leandra. Uh, so it is safe to assume that user code, meaning your customers, uh, don't uh, have their own instances of this magic so the question is, is it safe to assume user-developed application code wouldn't have these magic numbers? No, they may. It's much less likely than that they would have them than we find, we find them occurring in our code. And for the OS structures, um, if they're only working with 32-bit uh, environments, which they are now, um, they don't need to change. If they want to be adaptable to 64 and 32-bit, or they want to move to 64-bit, and they have some of their own OS structures representing data that's uh, passed across the foreign function interface, then we have an extensive documentation on how you uh, convert your OS structs to the uh, elastic OS structures. We don't do it automatically, unfortunately. Questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>